my name is April Frederick and I am a soprano based in London, UK. Uh, little proviso, uh, I have just recovered from what I pretty much respect, um, or expect was the coronavirus, so I'm not entirely up to scratch, but I really wanted to take part in this initiative. I can hear the whooping and clapping outside um, for our weekly clap for the NHS, so I'm sort of clapping for them and hopefully this might provide some entertainment for some of them, uh, either now or later on. So here's my clap! Go NHS! And God bless all of the doctors all over the world. Uh, so, I am a soprano. I love song, but obviously a lot of what I do is usually with other people. And um, I study violin to a very high level. Uh, I did not study piano. I kind of scraped by uni and I'm really regretting that now because I'm of course cut off from a lot of the amazing pianists who would normally partner with me. So I'm having to kind of do my best putting together a program that is just me. So I have put together some repertoire for solo voice, a little bit for solo violin, and uh, two little pieces that involve piano, one piece of my own, and, uh, and then another one by John Ireland, and then a little bit of Beethoven to finish you off. Uh, so uh, let's bear with each other, and uh, if you know anything, sing along, it might just be the Beethoven that you know, uh, but I really wanted to take part in this, but also to kind of come as I am. And I think that a lot of times classical musicians work and work and work and work and work to get something perfect in your studio. You might do, you know, five, ten, sometimes twenty takes or something to get it just immaculate. But I think we're living in times when that's not possible anymore, oftentimes. And so in the spirit of modeling along and bringing what you have, uh, that's what I'm doing today. Uh, and just as a one last little bit of introduction, Music that's written for a solo instrument that doesn't have multiple voices like a piano tends to be a little bit different than other music uh, for two kind of main reasons. Uh, one of them is what I would call implied harmony and the other one is its use of silence. And uh, so implied harmony is basically where your ear sort of fills in the gaps for what isn't there. So the, the composer indicates it in the melody, but you don't actually get it. Um, and it's amazing that the ear kind of does realize what's supposed to be there, but and sometimes he'll kind of, the composer will give you this sort of sleight of hand that tells you, ah, yes, this is this is where we're going. And uh, so that's, that's one thing I really enjoy about uh, solo music. The other thing is the pacing and the use of silence. Uh, there's an incredible freedom in it because you are the storyteller, and I sometimes think this is the most direct connection we have to the sort of bards of old. Um, where you know, it's just you, you and your heart, so to speak, but it's just, it's just you and your voice. Uh, and so you get a lot of silence, and I think it just lets us kind of figure out what it is that we've just heard, what it is that we're just about to, to, to listen to, to really um, intuit the music in a different way uh, than if we have music all the time. Uh, so I am going to kind of take you in and out from some voice and violin, a whole different group of things, uh, things that I can just do by myself, uh, so hope that you enjoy it. So the first one is by Michael Head and it's called The Singer. So this is just about someone who meets just such a bard on the road and uh, is kind of enchanted by him, tries to make him stay, tries to kind of pay him off to make him stay, but no, you know, uh, all, all inspiration is ephemeral, it's the muse. And so we can't, we can't keep it, we can't hold it, we just have to kind of kiss the joy as it flies to use Blake's term. So this is the singer. I met a singer on the road, he wore a tattered cloak, his cap was torn, his shoes were worn, and dreary he spoke. Fa -la -la -la.
Right, I think I'm going to adjust this stand because I'm looking away too much. This is always the issue. When you have a music stand, it's kind of how close can you put it? So it's not visually distracting, it's not a barrier to your audience, but yet you're not going to kind of flick too much. Oh, the existential crises of classical musicians, I tell you. Right, so the next two pieces are by Jonathan Dove, who is a wonderful um, living British composer, probably one of the most well-known of his generation, probably best known for his operas. He's written over 20. I myself got to sing uh, uh, the role of Mary Crawford in Mansfield Park last year. It was great, great fun. These come from his settings from Shakespeare's play The Tempest, so the character of Ariel, who's this sprite. And um, so I'm just doing the last two from the cycle. And so Ariel's is a, a spirit and he, he wants to do whatever he can for his master Prospero and he can do a lot. Um, and Prospero is kind of sulking at this stage or he's, 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 he's not answering as, uh, as Ariel had expected. And you, you can sort of hear in the second section how he writes in the sort of hesitation. And I love it because the timing really does feel like when you're trying to get someone to answer you and you're not getting back what you expect. I, th I think that the timing is very, very clever here. Uh, and so you can sort of hear that in some ways non-existent dialogue, uh, but the silence is very telling. And then in the second one, is there more toil? Um, Prospero has made Ariel promise that if he helps him with this particular task, then he will set him free. And Ariel is just at the end of his rope. He just, he just wants to be done. And he, he's reminding Prospero, listen, you said this, you said you were gonna do this. And then I make this very strange sound. It's an intake of breath, kind of an aggressive noise. <laughs> this, is, this is Ariel being set free. And then just actually thinking of his freedom. So for me, I think this was actually the first day when I got to go outside again after um, having the illness and being in, in self-isolation, just the sense of being able to leave my bed, to leave my room, to go into the kitchen again, but to leave my front door. I, it, it was just this unimaginable freedom. Uh, and then just it feels like the world's your oyster. Um, and so being very small, he can hang out in, in blossoms and, and under little things. And um, I, I just think that Doves does a wonderful job of being really evocative here. So this is number four and five from Ariel Songs by Jonathan Dove. I drink the air 
that under the blossom that hangs on the bough, hangs on the bough. I drink the Right, so time for a change up. I am going to play a little bit of violin. And again, I am a lapsed violinist, so uh, forgive all squeaks and unintended whistles and sounds. I'm just going to play for you one of my favorite little go to pieces. This is originally a melody from Bach's Goldberg vari Variations, written for piano. But this is a version which was kind of written for and adapted uh, for the film The English Patient by the composer Gabriel Yared. And I'm kind of adapting it further by basically just doing the melody line. And um, just listen for this one particular bit right in, t um, in the end when I just switch a note just a semitone. And this is kind of a thing which I think Bach is famous for. So... Um, normally you would have, uh, I'd be natural, you would have this uh, And he flattens it, he puts it down, so you get. And that's one of those bits when, again, he can write the, the change of harmony into the melody. And you can almost hear it even though the other harmony isn't there. So this is the Convento di Santa Anna from the English Patient, adapted from Bach's Goldberg Variations. This is Johann Sebastian Bach, who's probably... I don't know, number one on the kind of most famous, best composers of all time. There is no one like Bach.
some singing. Back to my happy place. Okay. So, the next piece on the docket is three short pieces by a composer named Dominic Argento. So, we very sadly lost um, Argento in 2019. He had a long and prolific career, most of which he spent uh, at the University of Minnesota. And um, Minneapolis and St. Paul, like Budapest, is straddling two rivers, and that's where I went to university in St. Paul, so it's kind of close to my heart. And um, so Argento set this for um, a local soprano named Maria Jetty, um, who's had an amazing career there. And um, I think they're just wonderful. And again, listen to all of the, the harmonies that he implies and sometimes kind of slips us from chord to chord to chord and just the most amazing kind of harmonic sleight of hand. You think, how did he do that? How did he get us from there to there? And if you try to kind of map where he was going harmonically, it would be one of those kinds of images, so it's quite fun. The first poem is setting a text by Walt Whitman, uh, so the American 19th century poet. The second one is by Walter de la Mer, the British so-called Georgian poet and um, of the early 20th century. And the final one is by Alan Lewis. And they sort of chart this journey. I think um, the last invocation, the first one by Whitman, starts in a very interior space. Um, it's very, very reflective about the soul and addressing the self. Number two, silver is very, very evocative, just about all the different kind of images, mostly by moonlight, of things that, that have silver. This very kind of almost elvish, um, uncanny sort of feeling to it. And then deep is the heart of the lake is addressed to the beloved. So you have these three different sort of modes of address. Um, so this is Three Meditations by Dominic Argento.
from the shadow cold, the white breasts peep of doves in silver feathered sleep. A harvest mouse goes scampering by with silver crowns and a Right, so now we have one that is quite special to my heart. I haven't sung this since I was 22 uh, at my final recital at Northwestern um, University. So this is Namarie. This is a setting of Galadriel's Lament. So it's what she sings to the Fellowship of the Ring. 
as they leave Lothlorien in the Fellowship of the Ring from The Lord of the Rings uh, by Tolkien. And this is a setting where Donald Swan, who is best known to Brits from the sort of comedy musical duo Flanders and Swan. And he wanted to do some Tolkien settings, and so he brought them to Tolkien, who was still alive at the time, and he played a little bit of what he had in mind for this one. And Tolkien said, well, I sort of had something more in mind like this. And he went up to the piano and played what was very like a plain chant. So this is very much kind of what came out. And so I'll go back and forth playing violin and singing. And what she's singing about is exile. Uh, so th you know, there's a lot of kind of intricate history which you don't need to know about. What, she, what she's saying is that you know, the golden leaves fall in the wind, years uncountable as the wings of trees. Years like swift draughts have passed away in the high halls, sweet nectar. In the west, beyond the borders of Varda's domes of blue, in which twinkle the stars, the voice, um, the holy queen's song. Now who will fill the cup from me? And, 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 and then talks about the kind of Varda, so the, the, sort of the goddess of the stars lifting up her hands, and then all roads are covered deeply in shadow. And from the grey country, uh, darkness kind of lies upon the foaming waves between, and it covers the, the, the jewels of Karakiria forever. And now lost is, lost to one from the east is Valimar, uh, Valimar. Farewell, may it be that thou wilt find Valimar. And you know, the elves left Valimar of their own volition, once and so they've had several thousand years to kind of rue the rue the day and they eventually do get to go back but at this stage it all looks very perilous and like it's it's not going to happen and so it's just all about loss and i think that this is probably something that we can all really relate to right now because so many things that just seem like a bedrock of our society are just suddenly and so swiftly gone and it didn't even take thousands of years it took you know months um so it's 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 a lament and i think this is a time for lament uh, so it just somehow seemed really appropriate to um, include this.
Well, I'm gonna go from one farewell to another. And this is a little bit of bluegrass. I first came across this, I think, must have been when I was about 10. Um, and it was used and made famous in the series The Civil War. It's just a piece called The Ashokan Farewell. We're about to go into Americana. One more in this vein, uh, which is just the, the hymn, Near My God to Thee. And uh, tradition has it that the musicians who were on board the Titanic chose to stay on board and give their lifeboats uh, to other people, to women and children, and so went down on deck with their instruments playing this hymn about kind of asking God to be close to them in that time of disaster, in that time of loss. And I can't help thinking about all the health professionals who were sort of coming out of retirement and one um, that I heard of this week, you know, who, who had just come out um, and died within a week of going back into the field. And it's just these huge sacrifices that we're making, but I think also just this idea that we are all called upon in these times to, you know, to, I guess, you know, actually consider, my goodness, my actions make a difference. And, you know, we always knew that, but we, we see it so clearly now. Um, and it probably also slightly feels like we're on a Titanic, let's, let's be honest. Um, it's kind of it's totally disorienting times. Uh, and I guess for myself as a person of faith, I have found it just amazingly steadying to, to think that I, I am never left alone, even in the midst of calamity, almost especially in the midst of calamity. Um, so just hope that you enjoy this hymn. And if you know the words, then sing along.
Right, folks, here we get, here's where it gets awfully exciting for me. Um, because, I think I told you, I did tell you, I uh, do not play the piano. I really, really don't. Uh, it probably doesn't help that I'm always kind of hanging around with world-class musicians who really, really do. But um, I have always been tremendously uh, self-conscious about playing piano. So the fact that I'm actually considering doing this shows you <laughs> uh, just how desperate things are. You know, it takes a pandemic to get me to play piano in public. Um, so, uh, y'all are really honored, uh, or, but I also uh, beg, your, beg your forbearance here. So I would like to just start these last little three pieces um, with a setting of Psalm 77. I heard a podcast um, from someone that's part of Mockingbird Ministries that was talking about Psalm 77, and she is particularly talking about you know this the, the, these last verses when it's saying that you know when, when the waters saw you know God they they convulsed and they writhed and the lightning was all very dramatic, and then the words your way was through the sea and your path through the deep waters, but your footsteps were unseen. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. And I just kind of sat with those and I thought, gosh, I, I want to set this. Um, I hadn't done any composition in a while. And again, it's for my own meager skills. Um, but I, I, I enjoyed some of, I suppose, what I was able to sort of draw out uh, the, the kind of this big journey. And songs always start from a place, or oftentimes these songs start from a place of being disconsolate. Of, of things just being awful and then the psalmist kind of walks through God's past faithfulness and then kind of ends up in a sense in the same place that he always was but in terms of circumstance but inside himself he's different and that's kind of what I suppose I feel about this so I've enjoyed preparing it and, and writing it it's encouraged me and I hope that you will enjoy this it's just Psalm 77 I cry aloud to God, and He will hear me. In the day of my trouble, I seek the Lord. In the night, my hand is stretched out. Oh, 
Right, so second to last one. Um, so I kind of hummed and hawed about this one, but I really felt like I wanted to do it again. Um, so I'll be leaving bits out, but you'll get the gist of it. Um, so this is The Garland uh, by John Ireland from his cycle Mother and Child. Uh, so the poems are by Christina Rossetti, and it kind of charts the whole life cycle of Victorian motherhood from birth, well, through to to death, infant mentality, as was so common in those times. And this song has always kind of stayed in my memory since I had the chance to record it uh, with the amazing pianist Mark Bevington for the song label. So do go and check out the actual full version on Spotify or on YouTube. Um, and it's just, so it's just called The Garland and it's just laying down different flowers you know, uh, I suppose the idea is, you know, on, on the coffin or on, on the deathbed. And I'm just aware that there are so many people who are experiencing grief and they can't be there at the deathbed. And some, sometimes they won't even be able to be there at the funeral. And it's such a strange way to experience grief. And so in a sense that I, I wanted to give this to those people. And I want to read the words first so you catch all of them. Roses blushing red and white for delight. Honeysuckle wreaths above for love. Dim, sweet-scented heliotrope for hope. Shining lilies tall and straight for royal state. Dusky pansies, let them be for memory. With violets of fragrant breath. We should begin where this marathon uh, began with the Ode to Joy. So this is of course Beethoven and the the tune and the gist of the words comes from his um, symphony number no. nine so it's his great kind of paean uh, is, is ode to what humanity is capable of. Um, so these are the words joyful joyful we adore thee um, I'm gonna again sing, I'm gonna plunk along the chords, so if you can get up the words, um, I think it's just the standard version as far as I know, um, then please do join me, so this will be our last thing. So joyful, joyful, we adore thee. But it's thinking again about the way that, you know, when humanity does come together and show brotherly love, that extraordinary things are possible, and well certainly in Christian faith, you know, Jesus sort of says, you know, you will show that you follow me, that you really are my people if you love each other. And that, but also that when we turn away from our circumstances and look to this God who is above all, that that is, that is a source of joy and peace amidst anything. Um, so there we go. Up humanity as it looks to God. So joyful, joyful. One, two, three. 
time that would be great but grace to you uh, wherever this finds you and all the best <laughs>